I think it's more tragic because if it's all just inevitable, then that means that the characters had no hope. They never had hope because they're all just like hopeless. They're all like pawns in this horrible, hopeless machine. <laughs> Welcome to Chiller Thriller, also known as Horror for Scared People. My name is Riley and I am here to hold your hand as we walk through horror movies together. If you find yourself interested in horror but maybe a little too afraid to get into the nitty gritty of it all on your own, I got you. Today's movie is one that I definitely think is worthy of all of the trigger warnings and content advisories I can think of, and that is Ari Aster's debut film, Hereditary. Personally, I went into this movie knowing absolutely nothing about it, and it was one of the single greatest movie-going experiences of my life, but I totally understand that is not going to work or be the best thing for everyone. I don't mean to overhype it because the world has already done that enough, but Hereditary is really a movie that means so much to me. It came along during a time in my life that was really dark and sad, and it was the first thing to make me feel excited and inspired during a time when I thought I would never feel good again. Which sounds ridiculous, given how heavy of a movie this is, but I just feel like I owe so much to it. I was actually kind of nervous to watch it again recently, because I watched it four times the year it came out. I watched it twice, two days in a row, in the movie theater, and I have not watched it since. So I was kind of nervous that it wouldn't meet my expectations, and I would be devastated if it wasn't as good as I remembered it being. But spoiler alert, it's still so good. <laughs> All that being said, it is time to get into the jump scares, which there are surprisingly few of. I want to apologize in advance if I miss anything that makes you jump or anything later on that really upsets you. There was a good chunk of time I forgot I was taking notes for a video and I just got sucked into the movie, so full permission to yell at me if I miss anything. But for now, let's roll those timestamps for the jump scares that I did not miss. <laughs> Unfortunately, jump scares are the least of our worries in Hereditary because the vibes are just bad the whole time. I've tried to identify the most clear-cut moments of something triggering or otherwise upsetting going on, uh, but we'll, we'll get into the nitty-gritty of all the details in just a minute. Welcome to Spoiler Town. This is your final warning to turn back if you want to go into Hereditary completely blind and somehow the world hasn't spoiled it for you yet. So, we begin with an obituary announcing the death of Ellen Tapper Lee, 78, and the few remaining family members she has left surviving her. Then we are blessed with a shot that has been forever burned into my brain, beginning with a miniature of the Graham family home and zooming in until we're revealed to be in their full-sized house. I have watched all the behind the scenes and the making of clips of how they got this shot to happen, but I still choose to believe it was pure movie magic. We meet Peter, a teenage boy being played by Alex Wolf, one half of the Naked Brothers band. Goes around, comes around, I hear you cry the biggest sound. As he's being woken up by his father Stephen, played by Gabriel Byrne, to get ready to go to his grandmother's funeral. At the funeral, we are immediately hit with two of the greatest strengths of this movie, which is Tony Collette's incredible performance and the really artful way this movie has of weaving exposition into dialogue in a really natural way where you don't even notice it was exposition till it comes up again later. We learn things like the fact that Annie's mother was a very private person and that the two of them weren't ultimately all that close given that Annie does not recognize a lot of the people who have shown up to the funeral. Interesting! We also learn that Annie's daughter Charlie is allergic to nuts and apparently pretty severely so, given how frantically both of her parents ask her if the chocolate bar she's eating has nuts in it. There are nuts in that. Does that have nuts? Because we don't have the EpiPen. No. I'm gonna go ahead and call that Chekhov's nut allergy, because you know they're not gonna tell you about a character's nut allergy if it's not gonna come back later. And in Hereditary, it comes back in a big way. Returning home, things seem relatively normal. Annie is a little self-conscious, I guess, that she isn't feeling as sad as she thinks she should feel, and 
when Steven asks Peter how he's feeling, he just sort of shrugs it off, which I think is a really interesting and really real portrait of grief that we don't get to see a lot. A little sad? Mm. Okay, I get it. Charlie seems the most affected by her grandmother's death, which makes sense after we learn how close the two of them were. It also seems like this loss has spurred on some sort of existential anxiety within Charlie, and she certainly has death on the brain. Um, excuse me, you don't think I'm going to take care of you? But when you die... Then some small spooky happenings begin occurring, like Annie thinking she sees an apparition of her mother, and Charlie cutting off the head of a jump scare bird. <laughs> Through different actions like this, it is shown to us that Charlie has certain oddities about her, without it ever really being outright articulated or addressed head on. For example, she cuts the heads off birds, and she has these strange little trinkets she likes to make, and she can often be heard making like a Cluck, clucking, a clicking, a, a tongue, that noise, I just spit. And you were the bird thing is a little much though, Charlie. Another spooky happening is Steven receiving a phone call that Annie's mother's grave has been desecrated. He kind of breezes right by that, and while I totally understand not wanting to dump that kind of stress on your partner when they are experiencing the death of a parent, it still feels like something that should be communicated, if you ask me. Speaking of communication, we follow Annie to a group therapy session, and this scene is just an all-timer. One of Ari Aster's greatest strengths as a filmmaker is on full display here, which is the knack he has for including details and situations that are so horrific I never would have thought of them on my own. He does this with the opening scene of Midsummer and a couple of times in this movie, including Right Now, where we learn through an amazing Toni Collette monologue that her family has a deep history of mental illness, with her father dying of starvation and her brother dying by suicide after fearing that their mother was putting people inside of him. We also learn just how involved Ellen was in Charlie's upbringing. I didn't let her anywhere near me when I had my first, my son which is why I gave her my daughter, who she immediately stabbed her hooks into. It's a really incredible scene, and just one of the countless times I'm going to be raging about how Toni Collette's performance in this movie was so overlooked by the award circuit. I just don't want to put any more stress on my family. Back at school, Peter gets invited to a huge party, and the way this invitation is phrased makes me laugh every time I watch this movie. It's inspired. The mood around the house has been a little tense, uh, not helped by the added pressure that Annie is struggling to meet a deadline for her miniatures at an art exhibit. So Peter figures out the best way to get permission to go to this party is to lie. He tells his mom it's like a school function or a school barbecue, and calling his bluff, Annie says that he can go if he brings his sister. Uh, does she want to go? Uh... Have you asked her? If you've seen this movie before, this may be the point where your hands start sweating and your heart starts racing. We're getting through it. Charlie doesn't even seem that particularly jazzed about going to this party, which makes sense because why would you want to hang out with your older brother's friends who you don't know? She'd rather stay at home and work on her little trinkets, but she goes anyway. At the party, Peter is surprisingly smooth, using his possession of weed to win over this girl he has a crush on. Hey, do you happen to smoke at all? I have really good weed. But Charlie feels justifiably anxious about being left alone. For some reason, someone at this party has baked an entire cake, which isn't something I ever experienced at high school parties, but maybe Ari Aster had a different upbringing than me. And earlier, we also saw someone furiously chopping walnuts with the same knife that is being used to serve this cake. Again, Chekhov's nut allergy. We all see where this is going to an extent. So here we go, folks. Peter is in the bedroom smoking while Charlie has a piece of cake and shortly thereafter has an allergic reaction. She finds Peter, who immediately scoops her up, puts her in the car, and speeds down the road to drive her to a hospital. As he is driving, Charlie has more and more difficulty trying to take a breath, so she rolls down the window and sticks her head out in an attempt to get more air. At the same time, 
Peter sees a dead animal in the middle of the road, so he swerves in order to avoid hitting it. Unknowingly making it so, Charlie's head smacks into a telephone pole they're driving by, and she is instantly decapitated. <laughs> This is gonna sound truly awful, but this was one of the best movie going experiences of my life because everyone was equally as horrified. Nobody in that theater had any idea that that is what was coming, and I just remember the silence in that room. I felt like I was gonna throw up. It was sincerely unlike anything I've ever felt in a movie theater before. I miss movie theaters. Anyway. The devastation is not over yet because we sit with Peter for what feels like minutes as he is frozen, understandably, in shock and trying to process what has just happened. And I can feel the pit in my stomach again. It's like we have to process the moment with him and it feels really bad. You okay? That naked brother is really good at his job. Operating on autopilot, Peter silently drives home and leaves Charlie's body in the car and falls into bed. I know, yikes. The next morning, we hear Annie wake up to go run an errand, and we hear her go out into the driveway and find Charlie's body. Again, an absolutely outstanding Tony Collette moment. I am really grateful that Ari Aster didn't actually show us her finding her daughter's headless body because I think that would have been a bit much, but even so, just hearing it and imagining the visual is almost worse. <laughs> no, I can't, I... And don't worry, we do get a shot of Charlie's decomposing head on the side of the road, so we aren't left entirely without a visual. It's pretty alarming, so Watch out for that one. So, all of that has happened, and suddenly this movie is very different from what you thought this movie was gonna be if you went in having just watched the trailer, because Charlie was all over that shit. We all thought this movie was about Charlie, and to have her, also a child, killed in such a horrific way just about half an hour into the movie's runtime was astounding. I think the audience was still in shock at this point and we all just experienced the collective horror together. But there's a lot of movie left, so carrying on. We see tensions increasing in the house with Peter still dealing with a certain amount of shock, Annie being cold towards everyone, and Steven just trying to hold everything together. We see Peter struggling in school, which frankly, I think you should get some time off if you accidentally decapitate your sister, but that's just me. And we also see him suffering from what looks like a panic attack while hanging out with his friends. Right. <laughs> just hold my hand, hold on. <laughs> while avoiding Peter, Annie goes back to the support group, but before she makes it inside, she is apprehended by Anne Dowd, who plays a woman grieving the loss of her son and grandson. They bond over their similar losses and meet to have tea, where Annie shares some of the more gruesome details about discovering Charlie's body. She also shares a story with Joan, which is Anne Dowd's character's name about a time when she was sleepwalking and nearly set her children on fire after dousing them with paint thinner, and how she thinks her relationship with Peter has changed ever since that moment, which maybe it did. Back at home, Stephen has prepared a nice dinner for everybody, but he finds Annie working on her miniatures, only to find it's a version of the accident. She claims it's a neutral view of what happened. like. I get that we all need to process trauma in our own ways, but I cannot imagine a scenario where making a miniature diorama of your daughter's decapitated head is helpful for anyone. Finally, everyone is around the table for dinner, and even if you've never seen Hereditary in your life, I guarantee you have seen clips or at least images from this scene. And for good reason, it's outstanding. This is really good, Dad. Thanks, buddy. It's incredibly heartbreaking to watch because everybody is just so deeply hurt. And for Peter and Annie, that comes out as anger and provoking one another. And it's just like this explosion of grief and sorrow and rage. Just fucking say it. Don't you swear at me, you little shit. 
Don't you ever raise your voice at me. I am your mother. It's magnificent and incredibly well acted, but it feels absolutely awful to hear Annie say explicitly that she blames Peter for Charlie's death and that she can't ever forgive him for that. I wish I could shield you from the knowledge that you did what you did, but your sister is dead. Terrible. Fuck you, Ari Aster. I'm sad again. <laughs> Annie removes herself from the table and Stephen is left trying to pick up the pieces. Poor guy. That sounded sarcastic, but I very much mean poor Stephen. And because this movie has no misses, next it is time for the seance scene. After running into Joan at the craft store, Annie gets wrapped into going over to her house as she tries to contact her dead grandson from beyond the grave. I remember this scene scaring the shit out of me in theaters, and it's such a classic horror movie thing, but the way that negative space is used here just puts you on edge that something's gonna pop up there. And there are a sprinkling of jump scares here and there, but never where I was expecting them. Joan is able to contact her grandson and frantically insists that Annie try the seance herself giving her some very specific instructions. Every member needs to be in the house. Your son, everyone. I hate this meme already, but Ann Dowd really does always understand the assignment. It's kind of innocuous, but I have to point out the best jump scare of the whole movie here. While Annie is driving home after this experience, and we hear Charlie's tongue click coming out of nowhere. <gasps> I think I screamed the first time I watched this. It got me so good. After waking up from a nightmare where she tells Peter that she never wanted to be his mother and douses him in paint thinner, Annie decides it's time for Seance Part 2, Electric Boogaloo. She convinces Peter and Steven to play along, even though it's the dead of night, and I find this scene very upsetting as a whole. Although it does have my favorite line in the entire movie, which is, What language is even that? It makes me laugh so hard, and I don't even know why, it just feels so real, like when you're talking and you stumble over your words or say things in the wrong order. I don't know, it just makes me laugh, and it needed a shout out. But the rest of the scene isn't so fun, as things start moving and flames start leaping, and it seems like Charlie's spirit may really be inside of Annie. It's scary, and Peter is fully freaking out. Which reminds me that people gave Alex Wolf a lot of shit for this scene in particular, saying that he was fake crying, which I thought was so silly. Yeah, it's like loud and dramatic and gross sounding, but what would you do if you were this boy? <laughs> I would love to see someone in this situation not ugly cry this hard. Plus, his crying made me tear up this time around, so I will not stand for any Peter slander today. There's so much tragedy in this movie as well, because even if you take away the demons and the rituals, it's still about this woman who has imploded her entire family after an unspeakable tragedy, and now she's the only one who can fix it and we just have to watch as she desperately tries to get a grip on things, which given how this seance just went off, she's not doing too well at. The seance has a profound effect on Peter as he continues to have panic attacks at school and begins seeing visions of Charlie around the house. Annie takes this to mean that Charlie's spirit is now malevolent, and this idea is only solidified for her when she finds Charlie's sketchbook with drawings of Peter with his eyes crossed out. She tries burning the sketchbook only for her sleeve to catch on fire, which stops when she removes the book from the flames. She goes to Joan's house to try and get some answers, and the audience can see that there may have been a lot more to Joan than met the eye. Joan isn't at home, of course, because we see her at Peter's school screaming at him from across the street, which in context is very scary, but just objectively is really hilarious. To me. Still looking for answers, Annie goes through boxes of her mother's belongings and finds a book of invocations, including information on Paimon, a demon king of hell who needs the body of a male host to inhabit. Don't worry about it. She also finds just a very funny scrapbook full of pictures of her mother having the time of her life but more importantly, revealing that Joan and Ellen were actually very close friends, so Joan isn't just some stranger she met at group therapy. We're getting into the territory now where this movie is so good that it makes me mad, like how someone could think of all these things to put into a movie. I'm never, I'm never gonna write a movie like this in my life. Anyway, 
Continuing her investigation, Annie goes up into the attic only to find mysterious symbols painted on the walls and, oh yeah, also her mother's decapitated corpse laying on the ground. We'll get back to that. But at school, Peter is not having a good day. We see him have some kind of episode and allow me to digress that no adult at this school is looking out for him the way they should be. Like someone should have intervened with Peter so long ago, but whatever. We see Peter's face and arm contort before he starts to slam his head into his desk. There's a kind of funny story about this scene where Alex Wolf apparently wanted to really actually break his nose on the desk, and Ari Aster is quoted as saying, I love you and thank you, but that is definitely not allowed. So they put foam on a part of the desk for him to safely bash his face into, but then apparently when they were shooting the scene, Alex like missed the exact mark he was supposed to hit. And so I think he actually ended up like really hurting himself, <laughs> which is super unfortunate and bad, but it's a really good scene. <laughs> Steven picks up Peter and has a long overdue breakdown in his car. And when he gets home, he finds Annie inconsolable. She shows Steven the sketchbook and makes him go upstairs and see Ellen's body for himself. And understandably, he thinks she is undergoing a severe psychiatric event, and he makes the connection that she must have been the one who dug up her mother's grave, bringing her body home. It's so frustrating because from Steven's perspective, we can absolutely see how he would put the pieces together and get to this conclusion. But since we spend so much time with Annie, we know he's wrong, even though it makes a lot of sense. What an exhausting movie. She begs him to burn the sketchbook, even though she believes that it will kill her, by setting her on fire, but Stephen refuses to play into what he believes to be her delusions. She desperately throws the book into the fireplace only for Stephen to catch on fire. I think Steve really might be the most tragic character in a movie full of tragic characters, but this is the end of the road for him. Tony Collette does what can only be described as a Tony Collette face as we see Payman inhabiting her and possessing her body. Now the rest of this movie is just full of my scariest movie theater moments. I was so deeply afraid the first time I watched this movie. So content warning for the rest of it. Peter wakes up and it is so dark in his room that you really have to wait for your eyes to adjust before you notice Annie crouched in the corner up on the ceiling. This is another top 10 movie theater moments, just listening to the little pockets of reactions in the theater as people noticed it in their own time. It was exhilarating. She scrambles away and Peter goes into the living room to discover his father's charred body. With no time to process that new trauma, he turns around and finds this naked smiley man standing there. Annie has clambered down from the ceiling to chase Peter into the attic and violently bang her head on the attic door. I don't even know anymore, guys. We have gone off the rails. Somehow, Annie is able to get inside the attic and we hear like a fleshy ripping noise before we see what's going on. And I think it is so smart that we hear it before we see it because I just remember my mind racing as to what could possibly be making that noise. And none of my guesses were right as it's revealed Annie is sawing off her own head using, I think, a piano wire? Nasty. Now the attic is full of naked smiley people and Peter makes the most relatable choice of the movie by jumping out the window. As he lays on the ground, we see a blue light pass over his body, like what we saw when Annie was possessed by Payman. We also see the shadow of a headless body floating up into the treehouse. Okay, I literally don't understand how I forgot to mention this, but uh, the Graham family has a dog and the dog dies. We don't see the dog die. We see the dog's dead body at like almost the very end of the movie. I am so sorry. That was a big, big oopsie on my part. In a trance, Peter follows up into the treehouse where he finds a 
deity sort of statue, including his sister's severed head, uh, presumably to represent King Paimon. All the naked cult members are there, along with the headless bodies of his mother and grandmother, and our girl Joan, who places the crown on top of Peter's head, calling him Charlie the whole time. Finally, having obtained a relatively healthy male host, King Paimon has arrived, ready to bend all men to his will, or whatever it is kings of hell do. Everyone worships at Peter, or Charlie, or Paimon's feet, as they all begin chanting and we zoom in on Peter's face and the credits roll. And that's Hereditary. I felt like I was going out of my mind the first time I saw those credits rolling. I had just never had a movie going experience like that. If I'm remembering right, I don't think I loved this ending on my first watch. I think I was just overwhelmed and caught off guard because now I love it in all of its weirdness. I find something so wonderful about Ari Aster just going, fuck you, I'm gonna do whatever I want, and I am on his team forever. What a little freaky deaky. <laughs> I know this movie has become somewhat divisive in retrospect, with a certain group of people arguing that it isn't good because it didn't scare them, which is a whole different conversation for another day that we do not have time for in this video. And obviously, I adore it and it means a lot to me, but I really want to know what you think. Did you guys catch this one in theaters and was it as effective for you as it was for me? Or have you never seen Hereditary in your life? If you haven't, I'm so sorry, this was probably a lot. Let me know what you think and until next time, remember, there's nothing to be scared of.